I have to confess, I've almost done this uh, talk before. I think I've almost done this talk before at the same event. However, um, there's a reason for that. It's three years ago. Um, there's a couple of new chapters been added. Um, but the good news is I think the message is uh, basically consistent, but the world's moving on. Um, so I'm going to resort very, very heavily to analogy. And the reason it's called Trains, Planes and Automobiles, I hope will become evident. Um, what people have looked at when they talk about the trading stack, it's very much a one-way process. It's far and forget. Um, we've been looked at the impact on our own trades. We haven't necessarily as an industry thought terribly much about the actual impact on everybody else. Um, and what's clear from the political controversy and everything else is really that's not good enough. So that's what a very simplified historical perception of um, that model looks like. But we're not really talking about raw performance. Raw performance by definition is constrained. So there are rules and there are protocols um, designed for the safety of practitioners. Um, so you know we went through from you know raw performance, this being the um, the salt flats, to maybe this being a little bit more like a racetrack. Um, but even that's not adequate. Markets aren't really just a case of a lot of experts travelling in the same direction. Um, increasingly, we've got an expectation and a regulatory pressure and a political pressure to take the um, wider safety of society into account. Um, and what's clear, because this is controversial, there are some people with very strong opinions. And I've selected those uh, two photographs for very particular reasons, which we probably shouldn't debate. Um, but one of the things is the political dialogue certainly isn't, doesn't seem to be particularly well informed by fact. And I think we we'll talked about, well, Kevin's talking about the Foresight Project. That was, I think, an attempt to get that process back into a slightly more rational dialogue. Um, we may not or may not agree with that, but increasingly society's got a different set of expectations on the finance industry. So increasingly, our performance is constrained by the ability to coexist with others. All the other stakeholders in the markets, and given the importance of the markets for the wider economy, the expectations of stakeholders in the wider economy. Um, and if we look at, I've, I've picked the transport analogy, the reality is we don't travel on an unconstrained highways. We, we, we live every day with speed limits, with all sorts of restraints on raw performance. They're designed to contain its impact within the paved road and a set of environmental considerations that we recognise as normal. So much of the proposed regulations that's been kicked around is a very blunt instrument. Um, and in the absence of the politicians being particularly motivated to listen to this, the subtleties of our argument, somebody else is going to have to. And I think realistically, that's going to have to be the industry itself. So we're going to need to address society's constraints. Um, what's the alternative? Well, again, back to the road analogy. There was a, the, the second act, uh, well, there was some legislation from the Victorian era. The Locomotives Act of 1961 was basically what legalized automated vehicles on the highway. It's MIFID, basically. Um, maybe Reg NMS if you're an American. Um, but they allowed some pretty lumpy vehicles to go around at what in the context of the time was quite quick. It's certainly faster than a horse, um, or a walking horse anyway. Um, that caused complete chaos um, and resulted in the introduction of the, the 1865 Locomotive Act, basically MIFID II. They required a speed limit of four miles per hour, two miles per hour in town, and that you had a bloke with a red flag walking in front of your car. Um, if we imagine the global transport system trying to operate under those, that regime now, it really wouldn't have functioned very well. Um, and then eventually the legislative regime got a bit more sophisticated and they started to develop uh, more intelligent ways. The, that regime um, gradually got relaxed. And actually the interesting thing, it was relaxed because of a political lobby as well. It was the automo automobile industry started to beat the railway industry. Um, but that all sounds kind of familiar to me. I think we're in the process of that same evolution. Um, so we're talking about an environment that needs new types of data inputs and new types of controls, not just for our own purposes, but just to allow us to do what we're trying to achieve. Um, and that, I think, it operates on se several levels. So in terms of our individual level, you know, our, our, abil our ability and capacity to protect our own safety, the analogy is really about the controls within the vehicle. We're talking about um, data about things that allow us to run at much greater traffic density, allow us to, tra to travel faster on the same highways and observe the constraints that we operate in um, in a more intelligent way. Basically sort of situational awareness type situation. Um, 
but that's something at a collective level as well. We've got, we're increasingly going to have systems imposed on us or we have to adopt and help educate them um, that result in smarter regulation, that harness our ability to manage those risks and preempt hazard. So effectively, rather than seeing the, the environment itself as a completely unconstrained salt flat, we're going to have to get used to the idea that the, that the environment itself has controls. And I suspect, ultimately, that those constro controls aren't static. So if the condition of the environment isn't static, you know, the, the, the red flag analogy is, isn't the fact that there are times when driving at two miles an hour is the right thing to do, but it doesn't particularly result in an efficient um, social outcome. At the same time, driving at 70 miles an hour in a thick fog and a rainstorm isn't a great idea anyway, because it just doesn't end well. Um, so we've got um, a market oversight perspective where effectively the variables and the constraints that define market practice, I think, are going to have to themselves become intelligent and data driven. Um, and that needs enforcement. So we then need, you know, when people don't play by those rules and don't constrain themselves and operate within those constraints, there needs to be methods, so speed cameras, um, automated number plate recognition. We have patterns, we leave footprints in the markets we operate in which can be used to detect, you know, given adequate data and adequate uh, information. They can be used to spot abusive behaviour. The bad guys hiding under the guise of legitimate practice uh, need to be found out and held to account. So we've got increasingly a sort of data-driven need for market surveillance. So we're not really just talking about the controls that guide us and give us control over the, over the vehicles that we're operating in. But at the level of the execution venue, we've got markets expected to monitor what's going on. We need economic impact, where rather than this, these rules being you know, just absolute, they affect the cost of capital, they affect the economics of operating in that environment and skew them towards a social advantage. Um, and then th things that spot just plain stupid behaviour. Um, and then at a really wide social level, we've got the ways that all of those, those highways and execution venues interact with each other. Um, and that needs very, very sophisticated, very large scale um, data driven surveillance. Um, it needs a feedback loop that um, basically sends positive messages in real time back to the practitioners. Um, it needs enforcement. And every now and again, when things really kick off, it just needs the plug pulling out um, just to let normality return. Um, and effectively, things get back to normal. Um, and I think that's one of the things that came out of uh, Kevin's comment. There's a massive absence, really, of uh, properly supported empirical um, research about this, largely because of some of the practicalities of analysing that data aren't yet mature. Um, but for that research to work, we need to be able to identify and monitor the behaviour of individual participants to create penalties for non-compliant behaviour but actually to, want to start to understand those patterns. And those patterns aren't just about price behaviour, they're about infrastructure state. There's a whole new set, because the feedback loops are technical, they're impacted by the performance of technology. So gateways, message transports, whether somebody's run a trawler through a, a transatlantic fibre fiber optic cable, have a genuine impact on markets. And they come with all of the problems of time series analysis. But one of the problems of that is it tends to leave footprints. Those footprints are very much um, the, the types of things you observe in time series. So they have a habit of looking fractal, have a high level of self-similarity. This is actually something I clipped out of the Foresight report. Um, and it didn't take a rocket science to work out that there was a rather bizarre harmonic. I mean, that is violating all sorts of stochastic assumptions quite visibly before it kicked off. I don't know what the time interval involved in that is. But if that feedback loop's fast enough, it can kick in before it all goes pear-shaped. So the analytics and the surveillance regimes, which have been about rule and have been about law, they haven't been about data, and I think increasingly they're going to be. Um, so that has a quite a profound, I think, implication for what trading infrastructure and what the perception of trading infrastructure is going to look like. So we've still got that conventional stack. We've got things going around the loop. But we've also got this new thing of market impact, market surveillance as part of that. So it's turning from a one-way fire and forget process into a feedback loop. Um, the types of data that feedback loop needs, um, again, not just market data, but actually latency data, graphs of latency patterns. If those things are operating outside of their norms, that is interesting information. It's maybe not information we understand, 
but that doesn't necessarily matter. The general rule is if we don't understand it, we want to start to slow things down a bit and get them back to a frequency where those feedback <coughs> loops um, aren't about to have a systematic impact. And I think that happens at several levels. I've only drawn two of them there. We've got the levels for the individual. You, know, you as a practitioner can watch the impact that your trades are having on the market and that other people's, the infrastructure state of the market, observe those patterns, analyze those patterns, and when it's, you know, this is the vehicle control, basically when it's foggy and rainy, you slow down. If in the ultimate, you just pull the plug out the wall and don't trade. Um, you basically don't want to be at risk with your own capital. This doesn't matter whether you're an HFT or a buy side. You shouldn't be committing capital to a market that's in a, in a state of disarray. It's just not a very good plan. Um, at the level of the um, execution venue, um, when do we throw the circuit breaker? Do we throw the circuit breaker on a very simple one-size-fits-all model, or do we actually make the circuit breaker intelligent and intervene when it really needs to and when there's substantiated evidence of something going wrong? So I think that is going to change, and the types of data input required to drive it are going to change. So some suggestions. I don't know if these are good suggestions or not. I'm not going to presume. But these are ones I've heard being kicked around. Um, minimum resting order times. Foresight report and most practitioners think it's a really bad idea. But is it a bad idea all the time? I mean, there might be a time where making the contribution of rescuing orders capital expensive is actually the right thing to do. So instead of this being a blunt instrument on or off, you progressively slow a market down by insisting that the capital is committed. You, instead of you know, a, a, a discontinuity in liquidity, um, it's like putting the, vari the variable speed limit on. Um, raises the cost of capital, causes hot money to withdraw, um, you lose that, you basically the market's kind of grey out instead of just going uh, blank. But that's something the real money orders can anticipate and not be caught napping. If, you know, if, if the implication and the fact that this is happening is something that's announced and communicated. The big problem, it's not a capacity that's reflected in anyone's trading infrastructure. So certainly at the moment, it's probably almost impossible to implement. Um, smart circuit breakers, a bit easier because it tends to be the execution venues um, only that have to adapt rather than everybody else. Um, but the whole idea of those circuit breakers been invoked progressively um, and, the, the, and communicated. So just encouraging people to get their orders out of the market before the market stops functioning. And then there's other suggestions, and they're particularly popular with some of the venues, the ideas of uh, variable limit up, limit down thresholds that are really based on what, you know, analysis of the underlying. So what we're trying to achieve is not we're not going to stop there being feedback loops, we're not going to stop crashes, we're not going to stop market volatility. What we're talking about is containing and dissipating um, the detrimental impact of that at the level of the individual. Um, but there's still going to be pileups because we're in an interactive system where the actors in the market collide with one another occasionally. Um, look about that, it doesn't look pretty, but other side of the road, there's nothing, there's a bunch of emergency vehicles. That problem has been contained within crash barriers. Um, still not pretty for the people that mixed up, but it hasn't had a systemic impact. And that's really what we're trying to avoid, where the impact <coughs> is scattered all over the place, impacts a lot of people and, and causes uh, social carnage. All of that model's predicated on the need for a lot of data, which I think is statement and bleeding obvious, frankly, but um, not the types of data that we in the financial markets um, historically think about. Um, talked about timestamps, collecting graph data, collecting, like we're not just talking market information, we're talking all of the information about the state of the infrastructure, the state of the execution value. Um, it's on a level that we've never contemplated. Um, so I've just stuck a load of buzzwords up there, but I think the one thing is if that process is gonna be, is, is gonna work effectively with a market that's been pro uh, preoccupied um, with low latency, that process itself is going to have to be fast. So that's going to tend to get you up to the top end of that, where real time, uh, the real time infrastructures and the types of big data infrastructure and storage infrastructure and analytics infrastructure um, are optimized for real time processing. Um, and what are we looking for? We're looking for things often that don't actually require a profound and detailed knowledge of what's going on. Because human beings are quite good at intuition. Um, machines generally aren't very good at intuition, but they are very good at pattern recognition. So we also need to look at those patterns and start to build a, a sort of intuition as to what represents a market that we can allow the machines to, to, to get on with it. And when do we have to 
intervene. Um, so we need to kind of look at that in real time. Now, one of the interesting things, um, problem is that an awful lot of algorithmic trading has tended towards um, black box approaches. And the, you've got a lot of artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, genetic algorithms. They all share a problem is that we can't comprehend what's going on inside them. So building a control system that's predicated on our human ability to spot when the wheels are coming off isn't great if we rely on stochastic processes to do it because we don't understand the stochastic processes. It becomes completely incomprehensible. But what we do know is there are some good you know, theoretical and academic foundations that are predicated on determinism. So basically heuristic processes that are trained and learned through human experience um, and you know, don't rely on stochastic. They rely on closed form solutions and the, you know, the events might be, the, the implications might be imprecise, but they are predictable. Control systems tend to have that uh, stipulation. Um, if you look at a lot of um, engineering cases, uh, the absolute is we must understand why it did what it did, not just that it did it. Um, so we don't need to know everything, but we do need to know that when we don't know what's happening, it generally makes sense to slow down. And if we got that single principle, I found I didn't even take the watermark off that image because I couldn't find a free one. Um, we can refine the models and work the everything else out later. The immediate social priority is to, is to cast the form in which that market develops and the culture in which we operate in a form that acknowledges that social responsibility and starts to think of this as a feedback loop and not somebody else's problem. Because it is our problem if they introduce legislation um, that cuts it off at the knees. So new approaches to control systems. If you look at the engineering practices in other industries, we, th we think we're over-regulated. We're not regulated, anything, anything like as heavily as other, as other industries. Um, if you look at aviation, every screw that goes into an aircraft comes in a plastic bag with a barcode, it has full tra traceability through the supply chain, and the fact that that screw has been put in is logged. Every, every single thing they do is written down. Um, a lot of the engineering practices, because those intrusions and those regulatory constraints are so intrusive, the engineering process creates a massive premium on agility. Anything that allows you to operate with those disciplines but develop, still develop in an agile method um, is going to have a very significant um, financial impact. So we're really talking about you know, the re revisiting the theoretical models that we use to build control systems. So there's a few things there. Um, Information engineering techniques that don't introduce entropy into knowledge collection when across multiple people. Um, Test-driven development rather than stuff that starts with functional requirements and wor worries about quality assurance later. Um, agility with our processing and understanding of data that doesn't rely on, trans on you know, relational databases and schemas and, and a very structured approach because the one thing we, don't, we know is that we don't know everything. We need to be able to roll with the punches in our way we analyze data. And also expert systems, systems that increasingly you know, acknowledge and encapsulate what we learn in a, in a very highly agile way. Um, and that can take data in, that can operate within the constraints that society and, 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 and that we operate, and actually can model the realistic business processes and understand the relationship. So it's a big data problem, it's an analytical problem, and it's a control system problem. Not stuff we use now. But is that too much to ask? Well, we think financial data is big. It isn't big. A single A3 Airbus flying across the Atlantic collects 170 terabytes of sensor data. Think about that. But at any point in time, if they were all brand new, there's 23,000 scheduled commercial flights in the air at any one time. That's 460,000 terabytes of data being collected and analyzed every hour by something we take for granted. Um, manufacturing. Um, when somebody makes a device, they, the, the problem is when, you know, if they had a bad run of devices, they'd throw a whole production run away. It's incredibly expensive, and these things are being manufactured in colossal volumes. So they now test every single device through every step of the manufacturing process. So they're collecting 60 gigabytes of test data to make one phone. Um, the maths are on the slide. Um, but that's something, again, something cons consumer space. You know, industry dominated by a few big players, very high infrastructure costs. But they can turn the entire plant and engineering process around in less than 18 months. 
Um, so it's doable. Um, and I've, Nigel chastised me for this. Um, we don't want to end up in a situation where the entire financial supply chain can only be operated by leviathans. Um, and that's a risk when you've got those engineering disciplines where you've got that kind of um, types of control regime. But there's still a question of fitness for purpose. So the reason there's a picture of a gyrocopter on there is because I fly one. Um, this is a cottage industry. This is a factory in Italy. They make 50 aircraft a year. The entire UK gyrocopter fleet is less than 200 aircraft. Um, they are subject to almost, not quite, the same level of engineering discipline and control in that manufacturing process as Airbus is. So every screw still comes in a bag with a barcode. The fitting of every screw is still recorded. That little red box is the log. Every time they put a screw in, they have to scan it and it goes into a computer and it has a traceability record showing which component, where it came from, who made it. Um, the storage of the components is managed. To fire up the engine, that's getting analysed and you know, the things have got data coming out of them all the time. That is a cottage industry. They can e economically operate in a very demanding compliance regime. It comes at a cost. The component cost of one of those things is £40,000 per aircraft. The cost of getting it through the certification process exceeds the component cost. So it's an issue. Um, so the actual whether it's appropriate to apply the same standards to a cottage industry as to an industrial leviathan is a legitimate question, but it will have social impact and social cost, but it's still doable. Um, so here's a sort of challenge to the industry. So, you know, the management of social impact and reputation is a big deal. I mean, it genuinely is. If we don't get our heads around it, we're going to be faced with uh, knee-jerk legislation that, that uh, isn't optimal. Um, I think as an industry we need to embrace those kinds of engineering disciplines and adopt much more of a, a sort of, you know, recognise the systemic impact of everything we do um, and not have processes that are entirely driven by functional our own functional requirements but are driven by constraints, regulatory constraints and engineering imperatives. Um, that kind of data analysis doesn't work if you apply you know, transactional data. Um, methodologies to it. It's not about books and records, relational databases, CEP. It's about a whole different approach to information analysis, the sorts of technologies that are being used in social media. Um, the rest of the world's already got its head around this. The financial industry has been a laggard in moving past transactional thinking. Um, standards comes out the Foresight Report. You can't do that data analysis unless the data means something consistent. So that, I think that's a really big priority. I just don't see how any of this becomes possible um, without a level of standardization. Um, and then research and agility as two objectives. So I think, you know, basically hats off to the Foresight guys. It's one of the few initiatives to actually try and look at this with, the bod with, the, you know, with, with an empirical and an academic perspective. And I think the constraints on the conclusions were largely, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, the constraints are largely the lack of availability of more data. The, you know, the, 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 the data analysis was, was one of the things that limited the uh, scope and conclusions of the project, and a lot of the conclusions that come out are around the need to get that resolved. Um, I lied about the trains. There's only one train in this, and it's the one that we're trying to avoid. Um, every social system has been through this evolution. Early railways, complete disaster. How often do you get a rain cr rail crash now, and how big a deal is when it happens? Um, finance markets are no different. We're used to thinking of them as individual actors in a, in a capitalist system. They have social impact, they need social infrastructure, they need social constraints, and they need the same sort of um, legislation and regulatory regimes as everything else um, that performs the same function. <coughs>